Child's Banner is almost out or is already out when you watch this video and you're probably wondering if he's good or not. Well, I can't tell you the highest numbers he can do in-game, but I can't tell you how much of a threat he is to us travelers, to the several regions of Teyvat, yes, including Sneznaya and the Fatui itself, and even the gods of Celestia. Hey guys, what's up, Aru? And Child's been quite a guilty pleasure character of mine, even though everyone says that he's a skip or not worth investing in. So I decided to make a more in-depth analysis on everything about Child's lore that I can squeeze into this video. As always, you can skip to the parts that you want to see, but if you stick with me throughout this video, you'll have a better understanding and be more appreciative of Tartalia as a whole. I'll be making a series out of this video format using all the playable characters in-game. So without further ado, let's dive into Teyvat's interesting individuals, featuring Tartalia, the Child of the Devouring Deep. Starting off with his backstory, for anyone who isn't fond of reading every bit of lore in Genshin, Tartalia in his early childhood <laughs> wasn't the warm, seemingly friendly, and unpredictable killing machine that we see today. It was quite the opposite really. The young Ajax was once a scaredy cat and hesitant little boy in the seaside village of Mori Pesok. But his ambitions were as high as the stories that his father often told him about. He wanted to become an adventurer and to be the courageous, brave heroes in his father's stories. One that always seeks the unknown, one who often fights dangerous enemies, and one whose entire life never has a dull moment. So at the young age of 14, he decided to run from his boring life in pursuit of the life of an adventurer. But little did he know that the danger doesn't only come out once you become an adventurer. And that danger lurks in every corner of Sneznaya and every crack on its icy floor. With nothing but a short sword and a bag of bread on his person, he easily got lost in the snowy forest. And shortly after, a pack of wolves and snow bears were already on his tail. The little Sneznayan boy ran and ran as much as he could, but the wild animals after him were not slowing down one bit. And as he was losing his breath, he also lost his footing while traversing the snowy forest. But little did he know that the slip of his foot would cause him to plummet into a bottomless crack in the earth's surface. There he found an endless darkness of another world. And there he met a mysterious swordswoman by the name of Skirk. Or vice versa, did Skirk, who dwelt in the horrors of the abyss, notice something within little Ajax that sparked her interest? So far, we don't know yet. Nevertheless, Skirk took the boy into her care and trained him. And oh boy, did he train him! In just three months, the swordswoman taught Ajax to weave through the abyss without getting a single scratch. But more importantly, Skirk had taught Ajax to stir up endless havoc from within his trouble-mongering nature, amplifying Jax's desire and ambition drastically to near-psychopathic degrees, and would later become known as his foul legacy, Devouring Deep. After finally returning to the surface, the grueling three months of his training in the abyss were a mere three days in the outer world. And upon returning home, Ajax was no longer the little boy his relatives once knew. He was self-confident, rash, and more concerningly, solipsistic and became a completely different person. The once hesitant and frightened boy now revels in the thrill of battle, feeling more alive the closer he is to death. And the once sharp and shiny sword he carried with him now rusted and faded away, marking the start for his new journey as a brawler, a squabbler, and a fighter in the village of Mori Pesok, and starting his new life as a warrior, an agent, and soon enough a harbinger for a certain organization we're all too familiar with. Interesting story, no? Well, I think so. Anyway, now that we've wrapped up his backstory into a tight little ball, we can finally talk about why he's such a dangerous individual. First and foremost, as well as the most evident of all, is the fact that he fell into the abyss and for some odd reason is still alive. <laughs> and what's more is that if the fall didn't already kill him, if there was actually something to fall on, he wasn't just destroyed or ripped to shreds by whatever horrifying creature was just floating about in the abyss. And the final kicker here is that he quote-unquote met an abyssal swordsman by the name of Skirk. 
as if Skr could have just killed him then in there for being a surface dweller or a possible threat. There was something that Child possessed that made Skr have the slightest interest in him, therefore not killing him outright. And that something is Child's trouble-mongering nature, his involuntary behavior to seek trouble, be it running away from home to be chased by wolves and bears, or in his later days, beating up every single person in the village for the sake of battle. Child was born with the innate nature to find trouble in any form. I take it he's quite a troublemaker despite his hesitant and frightened personality. But to Skirk, this is actually an advantage when you're in the abyss, since being prone to trouble is often translated to being prone to battle, and therefore something worth honing and mastering. Hence her interest in Child, and all she needs to do is twist that frown upside down, quite literally. So this troublemaking nature would then be sharpened and weaponized into his ability to stir up endless trouble or to stay in line with his abilities in-game to stir up endless havoc and give his personality a complete 180 degree turn. No, not even. She completely wipes every negatives that he has and turns his positive side up to 11 while throwing in a copious amount of chemical X. <coughs> From hesitant to self-confident, and from frightened of anything, to wanting to fight everything, Child's training arc was basically from Zenitsu to Inosuke in 3 days, or 3 months if you're in the abyss, but hey who's counting. Second is his mastery of combat, mastery of weapons, mastery of his vision, mastery of his delusion, and his upcoming mastery of the abyss. Which if you didn't know, his foul legacy is not a delusion. He learned it from Skirk in his training arc at the young age of 14. And did the name foul legacy devouring deep not ring any bells? Well, now that you know, I guess you can talk about child with a little more caution next time. <clears throat> so yes, his foul legacy is originally from the abyss. And that's not even the half of it. He mastered every possible weapon in the dictionary of weapons, and he's currently on the last chapter, mastering bows and archery, which is pretty decent in my opinion. What else did he master? Oh yeah, every possible fighting style and combat tactic to counter and exploit those weapons. Not to mention that he practiced all of this in the freaking abyss. You know Jax from League of Legends? If you didn't know him, he's called the Grand Master at Arms, which means master of all weapons. And he's so broken that he has to use a lamppost to fight his battles. And he's still overpowered to this day. Now imagine this guy being trained by the female version of Master Roshi. But this time, she's from the Abyss. And right after leaving, he was also trained by the general of the hidden samurai village. And we're not even done yet. He was given a delusion after he learned everything I previously mentioned. And don't even ask me how or when or why he even got a vision. Like, what the f*** Celestia? There's one person that Mihoyo wants to put every possible ability on, it has to be Child. Honestly, there's no other thing I could think of that Child could possibly get to be even more powerful. Oh, that's right, the sigil of permissions. And the final nail to this overkill coffin is that he's not even that old yet. He's probably the same age as D. Luke or Jean, uh, which means he has a long way before he starts losing his power. Number 3, this is just some extra in case the rest couldn't convince you. But more than that, I thought it'd be fun to talk about why even the Fatui Harbingers, or the Fatui in general, are cautious around Child. Yeah, every other Harbinger is sussing Child right now. This is mainly because of his psychopathic tendency to always want to almost die. Or to quote Pulcinella, the 5th Harbinger, one can trust him but one ought not to get too attached. He has unusual tastes when it comes to combat the encounters he craves the most being those that bring him closest to his own demise. But among all the Harbingers, Child was the only person to be given a delusion personally by the first Harbinger, Piero. Now I don't know about you guys, but being personally pinned by the top dog a delusion is quite a feat. You not only stirred the entire Fatui organization with your bloodlust, but you also gained the favor of the head honcho of the student council. And when it comes to anime, the student council is even more powerful than the entire government. No, but seriously, Piero is quite the boss among the Harbingers, and Child is the only one with that specific interaction. At number 4, Child's pride is a double-edged sword when it comes to his numerous missions, the people he meets or fights with, and most importantly, when it comes to his own life. This is because he's very stubborn with his own way of doing quite literally anything. 
the Fatui and the Harbingers themselves rely on a more discreet and cunning way of acting out their schemes, while Child is quite a rock star in his own world, doing things while being at the front and center of attention, because he believes that everything should be done without being sneaky or having to hide in any fashion. He's a real diva of the Fatui Harbingers when it comes to attracting attention, and because of that, he has his head inside his butt when it comes to listening to other people. This isn't really much of a downside for Child because, well, he's a combat specialist and the thrill of battle gives him nothing more than a huge hard-on. Child's pride often wins him every encounter 9 times out of 10, with the remaining 1 out of 10 being the Traveler, because, well, plot armor. But his undying pride is the sole reason why he's a Fatui Harbinger, and is also one of the reasons why the other Harbingers don't like him that much. His pride also carries weight within his ranks, and a mission they do is often completed without any problems, because Child's pride drives him to finish the mission by any means necessary. And you could say, well, this could spark some morally ambiguous decisions within his command, right? And to surprise you, his pride actually elicits into himself a certain care and affection for his comrades, and especially for his family, because well, nothing beats family. Finally, if I still didn't convince you enough, we already have other more prominent and powerful beings swallowed by the abyss, and for them, it didn't really end that well. The Kitsune Saigu sacrificed herself to the abyss for the betterment of Inazuma, and although it was voluntary that she didn't resist at all, she still could have stopped the abyss with her own power instead. But given that Lady Saigu was in a dire situation in regards to what she could do to save Inazuma, and her first-hand interaction with the abyss was pretty abrupt and didn't give her much of a chance to understand the abyss at all compared to how Child did, hence why she simply sacrificed herself instead of fighting it. Next is Mikoshi Chiyo and Takamine the Mist Splitter. Although these two characters are still vague to compare with Child, they still had first-hand interaction with the Abyss. Mikoshi Chiyo's corruption was brought upon by the beast that she slew and later became the host of the corruption, turning into the catalyst to spread the new sin or shall we say havoc that made Chiyo uncontrollable. In comparison to Child, who was taught by Skirk to stir up endless havoc, Chiyo didn't have the knowledge to maintain such an otherworldly curse. Takamine, the mist splitter, was separated from Hibiki and the shogunate in the cataclysm incident. He was then nearly overwhelmed by the abyss horrors for what seemed like minutes or maybe hours to Takamine. But to Hibiki and the surface of Teyvat, centuries had already passed. Similar to Child's situation, he came out of the surface after 3 months but only had been 3 days on Teyvat, and both their faces tell the same story. They both came back a different person, and to quote the thundering pulse, they had dulled eyes stained with blood and tears. But Child wasn't shot for the sake of saving him, unlike Takamine. Even worse, he was recruited by the 5th Harbinger, Pulcinella, in the guise of punishment, and to make use of his lust for conquest and battle to further the goals of the Fatui, compared to everyone else who died or lost to the Abyss. Child was given every green light possible right after leaving the Abyss. He is basically that one guy who for some reason has all the get out of jail cards in Monopoly, and his journey won't end there. Since the next update and future updates to come, as well as the new event, we'll possibly know more and more about Child as well as his journey within the story. So, in summary, Child is one hell of an unpredictable person that can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Given it's within the parameters of his organization, of course, his mastery of every combat style and every magical ability that Teyvat has allows him the flexibility and freedom to create whatever combination of attacks he wants. And the fact that one of those is from the Abyss, and the other two are elemental abilities that are basically overpowered compared to normal human beings. Which makes Child, or Tartalia, or Ajax, a walking Russian roulette on crack. He's also one of the Fatui Harbingers, albeit the 11th Harbinger, but a Harbinger nonetheless. And being within the Fatui, as well as being Harbinger, he also has his map exploration unlocked to 100%, being able to go anywhere and everywhere around the world. His unpredictability also makes him a random variable within the ranks of the Fatui, and who's to say he's planning something towards his own benefit already. He's the embodiment of pride itself, stubborn and solipsistic. If you haven't already googled what that means, he has a mindset where everything around him is non-existent. He basically thinks he's Neo from the Matrix, and is now trying to unlock his maximum potential and trying to become red Pill. And finally, he's the only person to be ever exposed to the Abyss, or any form of the Abyss, and come out alive 
and isn't killed in or after the process. Compared to all the others, she basically has the best luck when it comes to interacting with people and the abyss itself. And there you have it, Teyvat's interesting individuals featuring child, so now that I've stated how dangerously cracked he is, it's now up to you to pull for child or not. He's also on his third limited banner along with his second best in slot weapon. It does make him quite a common banner in the future though. But again, the choice will be up to you. So I hope you guys enjoyed that video and be ready for more videos about Teyvat's interesting individuals in future banners. That's gonna be it for now, I'll see you guys later, bye!